Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to Swayam Prabha. This is Dr. Sumiti Ahuja and I am Assistant Professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. In this session number 7 of Law of Contracts, we would be discussing about void agreements. The topics we, which we would be covering in this session have been uh, listed here, you can see on your screens. Meaning of void agreement, Types of void agreement which are identified under the Indian Contract Act 1872. Thirdly, the distinction or the difference between a void agreement and a void contract followed by distinction between void agreement and voidable contract and the session will be concluded with the distinction between void and illegal agreement. To start with the meaning of void agreement you can see on your screens void simply means of no legal force or effect. So basically void means it, do, it is of no value in the eyes of law it does not it is nullity. So according to section 2 clause G of the Indian contract act an agreement not enforceable by law is a void agreement. And Section 2 clause H defines contract as an agreement enforceable by law. So basically now we need to understand as to what is enforceable because if we say while defining void agreements if we are saying an agreement which is not enforceable by law is void agreement. So it becomes important to understand as to what do we mean by the term enforceable. You can see on your screens. A right or obligation is said to be enforceable if the party under an obligation to perform an act can be forced or ordered, can be forced or ordered to comply with the legal process. In our earlier sessions while discussing about enforceability, I have told you that enforceability means, so if we say an agreement enforceable by law is a contract and an agreement which is not enforceable by law is void agreement. We are trying to say that if in case any dispute arises between the two parties in a valid contract, then in that case the parties have the right to approach the court and claim relief. Whereas in case of void agreements, parties if in case any dispute arises, there is no legal remedy. Parties cannot go to the court either of the party which is aggrieved cannot go to the court and claim remedy. Moving on to the next part of our presentation, our session today that is types of void agreement. Now the Indian Contract Act has identified or you can say has expressly declared certain types of agreements to be void in nature. So we will be studying, we will be understanding or you can say going through the various types of agreements which have been expressly declared to be void. First is agreement of which consideration and objects are unlawful in part that is partially it is not necessary that the entire agreement all the terms and conditions of the agreement are, uh, are unlawful it may be unlawful in part which has been dealt with under section 24 of the Indian Contract Act. The next is agreement without consideration. We again have discussed in our previous sessions that an agreement without consideration is a nudum pactum, is a bare promise, right. And section 25 has expressly declared an agreement without consideration to be void. Third is agreement which is in restraint of marriage which has been described under section 26 of the act. Section 27 of the Indian contract act highlights the agreements which are in restraint of trade to be void. 
Now, agreement and restraint of legal proceedings are termed as void under section 28, followed by uncertain agreements under section 29. Section 30 of the Indian Contract Act declares wagering agreements or the agreements which are in nature of wager to be void. And lastly, we will be discussing section 56 part 1, wherein agreements to do impossible acts have been, uh, have been held to be or have been expressly declared to be void. We will be taking them up one by one. To start with the first in the line, first in category is agreement of which consideration and objects are unlawful in part. So, we have to understand that there is a difference between section 23 and 24. Section 23, which we had discussed in the uh, in one of the previous sessions related to consideration, that section 23 lays down as to when or under what circumstances one can say that consideration or object is unlawful in nature, right. So, we are talking about an agreement wherein uh, consideration or object is completely unlawful in nature. Whereas, section 24 is slightly different from 23 because it talks about agreement of which consideration and objects are unlawful in part. Let us see what it reads. It says, if any part of a single consideration for one or more objects, this is number 1, or any one or any part of any one of several considerations for a single object is unlawful, the agreement is void. It is slightly tricky that is why it has been divided into two parts. So, let us see these two parts again. If any, any part of a single consideration for one or more objects or any one or any part of any one of several considerations. So, in part 1, we are talking about single consideration and one or more objects. So, single consideration given for one or more objects, whereas the second part is or the disjunctive or is the disjunctive here. So, the second part says any one or any part of any one of several considerations. So, here we are talking about more than one consideration, but a single object. So, we are saying single consideration may be unlawful or uh, one of the several considerations may be unlawful. Similar is the case with object. So, a single object or uh, one of several objects can be unlawful in nature. The agreement is void. Now, what we have to see is whether a partial, partial unlawfulness or partial uh, Basically, if I may say partially if it is unlawful, then will it lead to the entire agreement being void? That is what we have to see here. So, after having discussed the, uh, the operative part of section 24, let us see what this illustration has to say. So, A promises to superintend on behalf of B, a legal manufacturer of indigo, that is the first thing he has to do. First. Uh, part of the job which he has to undertake and an illegal traffic in other articles. So, first part of his job is legal that is he has to superintend, supervise legal manufacture of indigo and on the other hand the second part, second aspect of his job is to uh, take care of or to supervise illegal traffic in other articles. Right. Now, B promises to pay on whose behalf A is uh, about to do this job. So, B is promising to pay to A a salary of 10,000 rupees a year. Here it has been held that the agreement is void. The object of A's promise and the consideration for B's promise being in part unlawful. Now, whole agreement would be void. Now, this is what I was talking about, whether the entire agreement will be held to be unlawful or if we remove the unlawful part or severe as we say in law, severe the unlawful portion from that agreement, we have to see whether the remaining portion can sustain, 
can sustain its ground if that being the thing then the portion which can sustain without the portion which has been severed then that part that part that portion stays so it says whole agreement would be void unless unlawful portion can be severed without damaging lawful portion so now this doctrine of severability is generally taught in in case of constitution so whenever we teach our students about the indian constitution and we talk about uh, various doctrines of interpretation of the constitution so this doctrine of severability is mostly referred there wherein we say so if if say for example a particular statute has been challenged as being uh, uh, against fundamental rights or against basically it is ultra wires the constitution then in that case doctrine of severability says one has to see that if we remove one or more of the provisions which has which have been challenged will the remaining part of the act survive or it won't so if it is capable of surviving in absence of the part which is removed then the acts remaining act stays but if it is not able to survive if it is not able to stand its ground then in that case the entire act is declared to be unconstitutional and void similar analogy can be drawn here the second part which we have to take up or the second type of agreement wherein uh, uh, which has been declared to be void in the indian contract act is section 25 so when uh, is stated under section 25 so when we had discussed or when we had a session for uh, on consideration on the topic of consideration we had discussed in detail section 25 because therein i had told you two things first was that the opening statement opening words of section 25 make it very clear that an agreement without consideration is void and secondly section 25 highlights the exception to this to this general rule so here for the time being we are only emphasizing upon the first part the opening words which say that an agreement which is without consideration is void reason being that it is held to be a bare promise because consideration means you have to give something in return of other person's promise it says section 25 it deals with exceptions to requirement of consideration for a valid contract and it begins with these are the opening words in quotes an agreement made without consideration is void and there are three exceptions which have been identified under section 25 as i was referring to which are which are exception to this rule of agreement without consideration being void so these three exceptions are i won't be getting into the details of these three exceptions because they are not relevant for the purpose of this session and have already been covered under the session of consideration but still let's just uh, read them three exceptions under the provision are dealing with i have mentioned them in short form to make you understand first is gift which is made out of natural love and affection and it is in writing and registered second is past voluntary services so in our session of related to consideration we had drawn a distinction between past voluntary services and past consideration also the third exception which has been dealt with is time barred debt what do we mean by restraint restraint means a restriction a prohibition so few of these uh, agreements which we will be referring to right now will again be repeating this uh, term terminology restraint that is agreement and restraint of marriage agreement and restraint of trade and agreement and restraint of legal proceedings we will be taking them up one by one to start with agreement and restraint of marriage section 26 of the indian contract act deals with agreement which are in restraint of marriage see the constitution of india has granted us certain fundamental rights so one of the fundamental rights which we have you can say available to us under article 21 so article 21 highlights two concepts basically which is life and personal liberty so keeping that in mind 
uh, it is generally said that entire human rights jurisprudence in India forms its basis from art, uh, or gets its origin from Article 21, right? So just it was just to add to your knowledge. Now coming back to the relevant part. So under Article 21, we having right to life, personal liberty, we have a right to choose our partner. We have a right to choose whom we wish to marry or not. So any agreement which is in restraint of marriage, that is which curbs our choice of marrying somebody, it is considered to be or it has been declared as void. Let us see what it states. Every agreement in restraint of marriage of any person other than a minor is void. So when we say, moment we use this word other than, that means we are saying agreement in restraint of marriage related to a minor is not void. This is an exception here. So, why do we need, why is basically this provision required? Let us see what is the policy of law. So, basically the policy of law or the purpose is to discourage agreements which are restraining freedom of an individual to marry or to basically exercise his or her choice to marry. Restraint, what now what important point you need to understand is that fine we are talking about restraint which is a prohibition, but are we referring to a general or a complete prohibition or restraint or even partial or uh, incomplete restraint is also something which will which is void under section 26. So as you can see on your screens in both the cases that is uh, if the restraint is general, general say we mean complete or it is partial that is slightly uh, a part of it. Then in both the cases agreement in restraint of marriage is void. Only exception as we just saw above is in relation to minor. So any agreement which is, uh, which is entered into in favor of a minor which is related to minor's marriage that is not expressly declared to be void under the Indian Contract Act. Now there are two examples I have stated you can see on your screens in the last point which are saying that if these are the situations or if we are talking about remarriage then in that case this rule does not apply. Let us see what it says. Agreement that upon remarriage a widow would lose her right of maintenance is not an agreement in restraint of marriage, not. Second is penalty upon remarriage may not be construed as a restraint of marriage. Remarriage is not coming under this category or this rule of agreement in restraint of marriage. Please keep this thing in your mind. Moving on to the next set of agreement which has been declared void that is agreement in restraint of trade. I was just mentioning to you that there are three consecutive uh, provisions under the Indian Contract Act which use this term restraint. Agreement, we just studied about agreement and restraint of marriage. Now we will be going through agreement and restraint of trade. Section 27 states and I read, every agreement, every agreement by which anyone is restrained from exercising a lawful profession, trade or business of any kind is to that extent void. Now moment, there are two things I would like to highlight here. So when we say exercising a lawful profession, trade or business of any kind, I would like to take your uh, attention to article 19 of the Indian constitution. So article 19 of the Indian constitution gives a freedom to the individual to carry on any lawful profession, trade or business. So if we are making any kind of agreement which is in restraint of such freedom, such fundamental right, it is void in nature. But yes, like 
we have certain uh, because whenever we talk about restrictions we are to, i mean whenever we say uh, that a person has a fundamental right to carry on any trade profession or basically when we talk about freedoms granted under article 19 we need to know that those freedoms which have been mentioned there are not complete freedoms there are certain restrictions but yes those restrictions have to be reasonable in nature right so similarly here because it says is to that extent void so the entire agreement so what we are trying to say here that the entire agreement may not be void but may be a clause or a provision therein is such which is restraining a person's right to exercise a lawful profession trade or business of any kind so to that extent that agreement is void it may not be completely void to that extent it is void there are certain exceptions to it i was just talking about restrictions so freedom is also not complete there are restrictions reasonable restrictions here in section 27 also is not completely saying that every agreement and restraint of trade is void there are exceptions to it let's see what those exceptions are the first exception to section 27 states saving of agreement that is an agreement which is saved from the purview of applicability of section 27 so saving of agreement not to carry on business of which goodwill is sold so it is trying to tell you that if you have sold the goodwill of your trade of your business then in that case and uh, in, uh, under the agreement in which you have done that you have sold the goodwill and there is a clause which restrains you from carrying a similar trade carrying a similar business that agreement is an exception to this rule that agreement and restraint of trade is void because as stated under section 27 this is one of the exceptions to sale of goodwill is an exception to the rule of restraint of trade being void agreement it says one who sells the goodwill of a business may agree with the buyer to refrain from carrying on a similar business you need to understand it is not saying carrying on any kind of business to carry on a similar business because goodwill we mean that goodwill means the reputation of that particular brand in the market the uh, i mean people know about it people have awareness about it so that is what we are referring to when we say goodwill right so if when a person is selling the goodwill of his business to another person then in that case he may agree the seller may agree with the buyer to refrain from carrying on a similar business within specified local limits that means within the limits of that area that place wherein the seller was carrying on his business so so long as the buyer or any person deriving title to the goodwill from him carries on a like business therein provided now this is what we have to understand that restrictions have to be reasonable so provided that such limits appear to the court reasonable regard being had to the nature of the business now say for example a person who has sold the goodwill of his business he was carrying on his business to uh, i mean his business was restricted only to a particular state in the entire country in, in the entire territory of india his business was restricted yes brand was a known brand but was restricted to a particular part of the territory of country now if he sells his goodwill to someone then in that case just think over would it be correct on his part to put such a restraint or to put such a restriction that the seller cannot carry such business anywhere in the entire territory of india including that state but in the entire territory of india that person cannot run any cannot run this business right just think over because it says provided that such limits appear to the court court reasonable will that be reasonable the constitution of india protects the right to freedom of trade and commerce just like the legislature this is an important point to understand just like the legislature 
cannot take away an individual's freedom of trade which means legislature cannot make any law wherein it is taking away an individual's freedom of trade as granted to him under the Indian constitution. Similarly, the individual cannot barter it, that is exchange, cannot barter it through an agreement. So, this is an, anal this is an analogy which can be drawn that like legislature cannot take away individual's freedom of trade. Similarly, so if you are putting a uh, burden, putting some kind of uh, obligation or a duty on the legislature to protect the individual's freedom of trade. Similarly, the individual has to take care of the fact that this right, this, this freedom has been granted to him or her by the Indian constitution and by bartering it, it will be at disrespect or it will be going against the constitution freedom. Again here as well under like what we studied under agreement and restraint of marriage, agreement in agreement and restraint of trade as well, both types of restraint that is partial or general are covered. Uh, you can see on your screens the last point on this uh, slide is dealing with an example. Let us see what it says. It says there were two rival shopkeepers in a locality. One agreed to pay a sum of money to another if he chooses to close his business in that particular locality. Business is closed, but the proposer refuses to pay the money. So, there was an agreement between the two parties, one made an offer to the other, both were carrying on business or they were running their respective shops in a, uh, in a particular locality, simil, same locality and uh, one of them makes an offer to the another person that see, uh, you just stop your business, you just shut down your shop, close your business, I will pay you this much amount of money. Basically, he tried to remove the competition which he was having in that particular locality. Yes, now we have competition act to take care of uh, these things, anti-competitive practices, but here we are talking about this uh, example in relation to section 27. So, if he is putting that, if he is, uh, if they are entering into such kind of an agreement, is it an agreement and restraint of trade? And can it be declared to be void? Yes, it is an agreement and restraint of trade. It is void. This provision number section 28 is one of the most important agreement which has been declared to be void under the Indian constitution. Again here also, I would be making a reference to the Indian constitution because all the three things, marriage, then uh, trade and legal proceedings or basically right to uh, go to the court, approach the court in order to claim remedy or relief. This also is a right, a fundamental right which has been granted to us by the Indian constitution. So, remember in one of our previous sessions, we had discussed about uh, Latin maxim, ubi just ibi remedium. That is where there is a legal right, there is a legal remedy. So, if I have entered into a contract with any person and that person commits a breach, that is he does not fulfill his obligation or his promise under that contract. Yes, the constitution is giving me that right to approach the court because my right, legal right under that contract has been infringed. I can very well go to the court and for and put my claim, raise my claim in the court. Now, agreement and restraint of legal proceedings is high, is, is stating this thing that if in a in an agreement made between the two parties, there is say one such clause which says that in case of any future dispute, neither of the parties can approach the court of law. Or basically, if I may say, they are they are waving off, they are waving off their right to approach the court in case of any dispute. Now say, there was an agreement which had this clause that uh, 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 neither of the party will approach the court. Then consider a situation that in future a dispute arose. One of them approaches the court. The other one counters this person's claim of recovery of the money or of specific performance, whatever the case be, he, uh, he counters that claim. 
Now, in that case, will it be decided in favor of the person who is going to the court claiming that his right has been infringed? Or will the court decide, give the decision in favor of that person who is countering that claim and stating that, see, we had mutually decided that we would not be approaching the court of law, so the, law, the court does not have the jurisdiction. The answer is, the court will be deciding in favor of that person who has approached the court and has raised this claim that his right has been infringed, therefore remedy should be granted to him. Right? Let us see, let us read now what the provision is stating. It says, uh, every agreement by which any party thereto is restricted absolutely from enforcing his rights, uh, by this we mean that uh, uh, from approaching the court to uphold the rights under or in respect of any contract by the usual legal proceedings in ordinary tribunals or which limits the time within which we may thus enforce his rights. So, there are two things again which have been highlighted that is restricted absolutely from enforcing rights under a contract by usual legal proceedings that is he cannot uh, absolutely giving away the right to approach the court. This is first. Then it says uh, or which limits the time within which he may thus enforce his rights which means that say again in one of the previous sessions we had discussed about limitation act when we were discussing about consideration the third exception to uh, our third exception given under section 25 therein we had discussed about limitation that is the time period available with the injured party to approach the court to claim relief which starts from the day the cause of action arose that is the reason that is say breach was committed so the day from which the breach uh, breach was committed starts uh, limitation period starts running and the limitation act which is there in existence in india it highlights or it basically lays down as to what is limit what is the limitation period in case of or in respect of different categories of transactions so this part says that say for example if in a particular transaction or if in a particular sale say the limitation act is giving the uh, time period of say 2 years to approach the court to claim relief. Now the two parties enter into an agreement and therein they incorporate this period or uh, they try to modify the period of limitation in this, uh, in this kind of sale and they write that if any dispute arises in future then in that case the party can only claim relief if the if he or she is able to approach the court say within one year of the dispute being uh, dispute uh, 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 being arisen right so the law is granting you time period of two years and you in this agreement is reducing that period to half from two to one so again taking you back to the uh, one of the most important essentials which we had discussed that is, yes, in a contract, duties are primarily fixed by parties, but they have to be within the bounds of law. They cannot go against the law. The second uh, clause B states, which extinguishes the rights of any party thereto or discharges any party thereto from any liability under or in respect of any contract on expiry of a specified period so as to restrict any party from enforcing his rights is void to the extent. It again simply means this only that if law, if the written law has given me some kind of right in relation to legal proceedings, in relation to enforcing my right, I cannot even if mutu through mutual agreement a clause has been incorporated in the agreement wherein this right has been waived off but does not it does not mean that in future if a dispute will arise neither of the party can approach the court. As I had given you an example earlier if the affected party approaches the court the court will be granting relief. Now there are exceptions to agreement and restraint of legal proceedings which have been provided under the Indian contract act let us see what they are. Saving of contract to refer to arbitration dispute that may arise. 
this section shall not render illegal a contract by which two or more persons agree that any dispute which may arise between them in respect of any subject or class of subjects shall be referred to arbitration and that only the amount awarded in such arbitration shall be recoverable in respect of the dispute so referred this provision this exception basically simply means that see i had just given you an example wherein i stated that uh, the parties in the agreement may incorporate that in case of future dispute neither of the parties will be approaching the court for claiming relief right so that is something which is considered to be void under the indian contract act but this exception says that in case of commercial transactions parties can choose the forum that is parties may decide they can incorporate in their agreements that see in case of future dispute arises we will be proceeding for arbitration for settlement of the matter if that provision is there then that is not a void agreement because it is an exception as provided under the indian contract act the second exception states saving of contract whenever we say saving of contract as i told you earlier it means these kind of contracts are saved from the purview of uh, this particular section saving of contracts to refer questions that have already arisen nor shall this section render illegal any contract in writing by which two or more persons agree to refer to arbitration any question between them which has already arisen so the uh, uh, small point of difference between the first exception and the second exception is in both of them we are referring to arbitration but in first we are saying that the parties have already incorporated in that agreement that they will be uh, uh, proceeding for arbitration and the exception 2 says the parties can opt for arbitration even at a later stage when the dispute has already arisen next is uncertain agreements or the category of uncertain agreements covered under section 29 let's see what it says agreements the meaning of which is not certain which is which can be seen from uh, the terminology itself uncertain agreements which is not certain or capable of being made certain are void that means either it is absolutely uncertain it is vague ambiguous and there is no possibility also through which it can be understood what exactly is the term let's see these three illustrations are from uh, section 29 of the indian contract act itself let's see and try to understand what do we what is the significance of section 29 A agrees to sell to B a hundred tons of oil. There is nothing whatever to show what kind of oil was intended. The agreement is void for uncertainty. This illustration seems to be uh, incomplete, but what it is trying to convey to you is that A agrees to sell to B a hundred tons of oil, but A may be a dealer in different types of oil. He may be selling different types of oil. now here he is agreeing to sell to be a 100 tons of oil so i agree to sell to you a 100 tons of oil and i deal in n number of types of oil but here in this point in uh, wherein i am agreeing to sell to you a uh, uh, 100 tons of oil i have not mentioned i have not made it certain which type of oil i am referring to remember in case of uh, when we were discussing about offer also so one of the requirements of a valid offer is this also that the terms should be very clear offer should be clear crystal clear there should not be any ambiguity in it similarly here the agreement the terms of the agreement should be certain in nature a agrees to sell to b 100 tons of oil of a specified description there is no uncertainty here to make the agreement void so this is this uh, second illustration is uh, in contrast to illustration 1 in one it can it is not made certain in second it has been made certain now a who is a dealer in coconut oil only this third illustration is dealing with this part here that is or capable of being made certain 
because this in this illustration the terms are such that it, it is uh, capable of being made certain. Let us see A who is a dealer in coconut oil only agrees to sell to B 100 tons of oil. The nature of A's trade affords an indication of the meaning of the words and A has entered into a contract for the sale of 100 tons of coconut oil. So, here even if the person says I agree to sell to you 100 tons of oil, it is capable of being made certain reason being that the person is dealing with only one type of oil that is coconut oil. Section 30 of the Indian Contract Act deals with wagering agreements or what we say an agreement which is in nature of wager. It states agreements by way of wager void. Agreements by way of wager are void and no suit and no suit shall be brought for recovering anything alleged to be won on any wager or entrusted to any person to abide by the result of any game or other uncertain event on which any wager is made. We have, uh, it is like you are uh, having a bet with a person, right. So, it is generally said that in case of agreements which are in nature of bet, betting agreements, there is no, uh, it is like it is only a situation wherein one person is winning something, the other person is losing something. Whereas, when we talk about contracts, a general understanding is that co contract is a commercial transaction. So, a, uh, any person, any party who is entering into a contract or who is entering into such kind of commercial transaction, in such a case both the parties would be gaining something out of it. One may gain more, the other may gain less, but both are getting something out of it. But the moment we say bet, it is only and only about money and we know one person will either win the money or may lose it and will have to give that money to other person. So, it is not considered to be a valid contract. Exception in favor of certain prizes for horse racing. The section shall not be deemed to render unlawful a subscription or contribution or agreement to subscribe or contribute made or entered into for or towards any plate, prize or sum of money that is whatever reward will, whatever reward uh, will be won as the result of the game of the value or amount of 500 rupees or upwards to be awarded to the winner or winners of any horse race. So, horse racing prize certain prizes for horse racing have been exempted from the purview of section 30. Now, the next part says section 294A of the Indian Penal Code is not affected. What do we mean by that? It says nothing in this section, section shall be deemed to legalize any transaction connected with horse racing to which provisions of section 294A of IPC apply. See the distinction, here it says certain prizes for horse racing, but here it says there are certain parts, certain aspects related to a certain transactions related to horse racing which have, which uh, may be declared to be uh, punishable, punishable offence under 294A cannot be enforced under section, uh, under the Indian Contract Act. I would just like to highlight one thing here that we are talking about section 294A of the Indian Penal Code 1860 here. But now the Indian Penal Code 1860 is no more in existence. So, now uh, here we are referring to section 295 of the Bharatiya Nyay Sanhita. The next is after wagering agreements, the next agreement which has been declared to be void is agreement to do act which is impossible. So, section 56 basically we will be discussing in the next uh, session of ours. Section 56 is basically divided into three parts. So, here this part is the first part of section 56 which states agreement to do impossible act. An agreement to do an act impossible in itself is void. So, maybe you promise someone that through your magic you will be able to uh, retrieve or you will be able to find out the 
लॉस्ट वॉलेट ऑफ समवन सो इन दैट केस इट कम्स इन द कैटेगरी ऑफ सेक्शन फिफ्टी सिक्स पार्ट वन बिकॉज दिस इज एन अग्रीमेंट टू डू एन इम्पॉसिबल एक्ट दैट बाय मैजिक आई फाइंड आउट योर वॉलेट विच यू हैड लॉस्ट फ्यू मिनट्स फ्यू आवर्स और से फ्यू डेज अगो Section fifty six part two deals with uh, void contracts. We'll be coming to that part also. So here, distinction between void agreement and void contract. Now till now we have covered the meaning of void agreement, the various types of void agreement. Now we are moving on to the third part of this uh, session, wherein we are trying to distinguish between a void agreement and a void contract. it has been seen that many a times people many a times students they tend to get confused between void agreement void contract and they end up using these uh, things inter these terminologies interchangeably but mind you mere change of this the second word in the phrase void agreement void con void contract mere interchanging them can lead to a different result altogether because they have different meanings what different meaning do they have so we have already discussed about void agreement that is an agreement which is not enforceable in the eyes of law right as uh, defined under section 2 of the indian contract act but now and we also discussed so many examples of void agreements now what do we mean by void contract because our understanding is if it is void it cannot become a contract because it has been expressly declared by the law to be void so it's a void agreement so from where does void contract come into picture now section 56 part 2 which uh, talks about impossibility of performance or which incorporates the doctrine of frustration which we would be discussing in detail in the next session but here for uh, the purpose of distinction between void agreement and void contract i would like to tell you that uh, void contract means a contract or you can say an agreement which was valid which was a valid contract when it was entered into because it was fulfilling all the prerequisites or you can say all the essentials of a valid contract but some supervening uh, uh, interference some supervening act or something has taken place which has rendered the performance of the obligation under that contract which was at once valid impossible so which makes that contract void which means when it was made when it was entered into between the two parties it was valid but now because of this subsequent change in events it has become impossible to be performed therefore it is void contract so void agreement is an agreement which has been expressly declared to be void where uh, from beginning but in case of void contract it was valid at one point of time but now it has become void so contract to do an act afterwards becoming impossible or unlawful impossible maybe because of impossibility of facts some change in facts and circumstances taking place when we say unlawful maybe you had entered into a contract with uh, someone to export a particular type of uh, goods or material now later on the government came up with this uh, order wherein export of that good or that product was uh, banned now that particular contract has become void because unlawful it has been rendered unlawful the next thing which we have to discuss is distinction between void agreement and voidable contract now here again see it's void agreement and voidable contract what we just discussed in the previous uh, slide was void agreement and void contract here it is voidable contract so void agreement is agreement not enforceable by law whereas so these are three points of distinction between void agreement and voidable contract first is void agreement is an agreement not enforceable by law that is you cannot go to the court and claim your uh, uh, rights claim relief against the infringed rights in the court of law whereas 
voidable contract is enforceable until it is repudiated by the aggrieved party i'll take i'll quickly take you back to refresh your memory by telling you about the about the voidable uh, contract remember in our session related to free consent we had discussed that if the consent is not free and is obtained by or is driven through uh, coercion fraud misrepresentation or undue influence it becomes voidable at the option of such party whose consent was obtained through fraud misrepresentation coercion or undue influence now we are trying to say here that uh, in case of voidable so that party whose consent was so driven will have two options and that party can choose either first option is that uh, the even if my consent was obtained through fraud or uh, undue influence was exercised against me but still i choose to continue with the, such a contract reason being that it is in my benefit even slightest of benefit but i am getting benefited out of it and i wish to continue with it that is one option available so voidable contract is enforceable until it is repudiated by the aggrieved party so if i choose to continue with that contract i can enforce my right under it if later on some dispute arises and the second option is that the party may choose to repudiate or terminate that contract by exercising his or her right uh, of uh, right that consent was not freely obtained the second point of difference is void agreement cannot become valid contract it cannot become a valid contract but voidable contract will be a valid contract if the aggrieved party chooses to continue with the contract i just told you about the two options one you continue the second you repudiate the contract so it says voidable contract will be a valid contract if the aggrieved party chooses to continue to stay in it whereas void agreement cannot become valid contract because the reason being that uh, there is some uh, uh, essential of a valid contract which is missing in it or you can also say if i may put it in simpler words that it has been expressly declared to be void under law it has been said that if this is the situation the agreement is void in the eyes of law so something which the law is declaring to be void how can one convert it into a valid contract one may have to enter into a different or a new contract altogether for that purpose third is void agreement cannot create rights for third parties because it's void agreement you yourself have not uh, obtained any right you have not got any right under this uh, agreement because it is void in nature as expressly decla uh, declared under law how can you pass on those rights to any person so void agreement cannot create rights for third parties but when we talk about voidable contract it says while a voidable contract can pass rights to third parties before being repudiated say for example a person committed fraud against the other person to obtain his or her consent and the contract was related to sale of a particular property right and uh, the person who entered into such one of the parties who entered into such contract whose consent was obtained through fraud got, gets to know about that fact that he was mis the facts were falsely misrepresented to him at a later stage but before he gets to know about it and uh, he repudiates that particular contract he has already passed those rights which he got in that uh, subject matter to third person so this point says void that is correct so voidable contract can pass rights to third parties provided the same is done before repudiation or termination of contract by the party at whose option it is voidable the last part of this session which we have to deal with is distinction between void and illegal agreement one basic saying is that it is it is very difficult to actually draw a very uh, clear cut distinction between what is void and what is illegal and something which is void is not illegal it is very difficult to do that so as it is written you can see on your screens 
that illegal agreement is something which is forbidden by the law that is law is expressly declaring it uh, uh, is prohibiting it or is forbidding a person to act in a particular manner whereas a void agreement may not be forbidden see void agreement is a void agreement because the indian contract act is calling it so agreement and restraint of marriage is void because indian contract act is saying so agreement and restraint of trade is void because the act is saying so in restraint of legal proceedings is void because the act is saying so right but section 23 of the indian contract act which we had discussed earlier section 23 lays down those instances which if present the consideration or the object is considered to be unlawful so section 23 of the indian contract act states the cases in which consideration or object is unlawful so that can be cited as an example in such cases agreement is also void so it is un, it has been declared to be unlawful but at the same time 23 says agreement uh, with with uh, without lawful consideration or object is void sections 25 to 30 on the other hand for example cover cases in which agreement is only void do consideration need not necessarily be unlawful right so see the distinction here we are saying unlawful as well as void here we are saying void but need not necessarily be unlawful so i would like to conclude this session by the statement here that every illegal agreement is also void in nature but it is not true vice versa not always true i stand corrected vice versa that is same is not necessary in case of void agreements thank you Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize a long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and or college exams, but I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude. immoral vulgar and senseless george bernard shaw absolutely loathed shakespeare as he did homer but perhaps no other criticism about shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller provided someone has told him the story earlier now this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true none of shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever they are all written using pre-existing materials pre-existing stories now does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist well i'll leave that for you to decide see you in the next episode of literary snippets <laughs>